Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and my name is Hao Wu, and my project is to assess the viability of applying double Fourier modulation for remote sensing. So what is double Fourier modulation? It was a technique that first proposed by Mario Ridgway in 1988, and to summarize their paper, it's basically they've discovered a way of combining in, uh, interferometry and spectroscopy to simultaneously detect the spectral content and the spatial distribution of a source. I'd like to highlight an example of NASA's involvement, which is the SPIRIT. And this is a space telescope, not the dead rover on Mars. Uh, what it does is it launches this satellite up and it's going to unfold in space in orbit. And these two arms is going to be the two arms of the interferometer. And this is some of its specs. To put that in perspective, this is the simulation did by JWST telescope and the simulation of JWST telescope. Basically, this is the range of the angular resolution for the Spitzer telescope. And here we have an angular resolution of a telescope for eight meter diameter dish. And in there, achieving sub arc second spatial resolution is the spirit. So that's how powerful this technique can be. The true reason I mention this is it has a similar concept to my project. And my project is to assess the viability for applying this technology for remote sensing. And that is taking the spirit, rotate it 180 degree and point it towards the Earth. Now, if we're able to achieve that, there's a lot of applica application. I'm just going to highlight the uh, civilian application. It can not only detect a fire, but it can also simultaneously perform a spectral analysis to find out what molecule lines are missing in the infrared region, hence determining what it is that actually burning. And there are a lot of difficulties changing this uh, observation equipment into an uh, remote sensing equipment. Okay, in order to make a satellite, we have to think as a satellite. So let me be submersive in a sec. Here, imagine we're on top of Reading with, my, with this little satellite. The, diff, the, the merit is that when you are doing space telescope, you point your telescope at an at a empty region of sky with a tiny point source. But when you're pointing that towards Earth, you have an entire field of view filled with heat source. So the, the information, the, uh, the intensity you get is going to be much stronger. However, there's a trade -in. With pointing that towards Earth, you're moving at a speed of 7.5 kilometers per second. That's five seconds from Reading moving to London where we are now. So we have to do things in a much quicker fashion and that involves changing some of the method, sometimes even entirely. So what is the basic theory? The, infra, the, inf, the interferometer can be thought of as a combination of Mikkelsen interferometer and Young's double slit. Let me just briefly remind you of the setup of these two. This is Mikkelsen interferometer. Let's consider for monochromatic light, and this will be the mathematical expression, which basically means a light coming in, being split into two equal lights, two equal light rays and being, def uh, being reflected back. And the x1 and x2 here are the, are the uh, uh, optical pass lengths in the two different arms. By varying that x there, we alter the optical pass difference between these two light beams. Hence, hence if we multiply by the multi uh, complex conjugate, we get the intensity, which has the this is the intensity of, the, of what we see in the detector, which has the X dependence, which means the OPD dependence in there. And things become more interesting when we combine that with the Young's double slit. Uh, we get a similar expression, but now we have two pinholes, hence the A1 and A2. We do the same trick to obtain the uh, intensity. And because we can impose the condition that A1 and A2 are roughly the same since we're looking at roughly the same region on Earth. And therefore, 
we get this expression here. Now, not only do we have the spatial, uh, the spectral phase dependence in the Michelson interferometer, but we have a tau dependence, and the tau being the time delay between different rays. So if I were, uh, if my source is is away from the plane, then it has a much larger delay. So let's examine this equation even further. We mentioned that this was for a monochromatic light source. And what if we want to do, do it with a broad spectrum? Then we integrate it with respect to the wave number to obtain the interferogram. And what this does as a graphic representation is we have a lot of, si a lot of cost waves in, uh, in, for different wave number. And as you go further in the OPD scale, the, you're going to get more destructive, destructively interfere, hence the dial down in this. This is, expression is interesting because we can rewrite that as a Fourier transform of the in, uh, interferogram, and it's going to be equal to the constant times the spectrum times a complex visibility. And how does that work in the experiment? Well, this is a um, telescope model that designed by uh, uh, Dr. Savini and a lot of uh, other uh, scholars involved. And we can see from this, by moving the spatial arm, you are changing the time delays. Hence, you're changing that term and that term. And by moving the spectral arm, you're changing the, mic the, sp the spectral phase in the Michelson interferometer, affecting that term in there. And it's by combination of this, we obtain an interferogram that has both the spatial and the spectral content. Things become a little bit more simplified in the uh, if we try to adopt this for the design of a satellite. We can attempt this without a movable baseline because as the satellite moves from one location to another, then the, the spectral phase, if we're looking at the same point of interest, the spectral phase increases automatically as you go further away. Of course, this figure is being exaggerated to illustrate my point. And for every uh, spatial phase, we can move our spectral arms to obtain the interferogram. Now, going to my simulation. Uh, firstly, I have to define all the constants that's using, which basically to tell, tell the computer that we have this situation. <coughs> Then I define the ground scene. The ground scene is defined as a wavelength on the y-axis and the position on the x-axis with every term the intensity for different wavelengths and for different position. Now I define some parameters which I later will use in my program, some global constants. <clears throat> and now we're going to the, the, the actual scan. Loop one, we define a spatial scan, which first define the two beams, the two, uh, the, the two scenes my two telescopes are looking at. And if we plot the result out, this is what we're going to get. The blue beam being the blue scope and the red beam being the red scope. And you can see they are uh, a, they're simulated to be a Gaussian function. And now we go to loop two, which is cycle through all the wavelengths. And here I've defined the spatial phase and the uh, spectral phase. And then going to loop three, which is cycling through the OPD. Now we're getting to the engine of this uh, Fourier transform uh, spectroscopy, which is this equation here. And what the combination of these three loops does is the following. We first go into loop one, locate a, a spatial point in space, and then it goes into the loop two to find the wavelengths to do the scanning. And then we go into cycling for all OPDs. And after we've sampled all the OPDs, we change 
to another wavelength and repeat the procedure for different uh, OPDs again. And when we finish scanning that, we move into the next spatial points and do this. So when we get out of these three loops, what we're going to get is a three-dimensional matrix with wavelengths, OPD, and the, and the position on the ground. The next step is simply perform the integration, which is done by summing, by crushing down the OPD dimension and the wavelength dimension. And now we add a bin for the fixed number, which I will go into during my result part. And the last step is simply to plot everything. Now, coming to the result. For the first trial, we do a monochromatic laser at 7.7 .7 micron. That translates to 1.3, 10 to the 5 me per meter. And this is my two beams scanning. And this is my interferometer as it goes through the point, as they go through the heat point, this uh, amplitude increases. And this is the spectrum that's being over, over plotted uh, each other as my telescope move. And now coming to my bin function. Remember this equation we introduced earlier? And what the bin function did is it fixed uh, it fixes a, uh, a wave number, hence making this be a constant. So what you see in the black, uh, in the blue, uh, in the blue curve there, should be a multiplication of that complex visibility. Com complex visibility. Trial two for a two hotspots. Um, we do the same procedure. And now, there's a couple of points to raise here. First of all, what you should, what you, uh, what's expected is a black body curve, but this has a lot of spikes. That's because uh, my simulation uses only 50 wave number points. So I don't actually have a continuous spectrum. And the fact that my program identified that means I have a, a good enough resolution to, to do so. And the second problem is this doesn't actually look like a, a black body curve. It's because this spectrum is being modulated spatially by that um, blue bin function we just highlighted earlier. So what to do? The next step is to do a more complex scene, and we do the exact same procedure. And we obtain uh, a synthetic beam like that. Now notice the relation between these three. It can be described as the tensor product of the sin times the spectrum. A tensor with the spectrum gives us the beam, uh, the synthetic beam. And now we can apply a con what's called a convolution theory, which states that if I have f tensor g equal to h, then the Fourier transform of h is equal to the, the product of the two Fourier transforms. And what that means is we can take Fourier transform of these two graphs to obtain h hat and g hat. And what we do is use h hat divided by g hat to obtain the fk, hence uh, re inverse Fourier transform to get what the beam actually, uh, to, to get what my satellite actually sees. Now, in conclusion, we've successfully applied this double Fourier modulation for remote sensing, and based on our current result, it's very feasible. However, there are a lot more variables to be introduced into this. For example, the atmospherical disturbance and the effect of random error generated by instruments. And finally, we can consider all I've introduced is for just one pixel in my uh, detector. What if I, we can have an array of pixels in my detectors that can reduce the, the scan speed dramatically. And that concludes the end of my presentation. These are the references I've quoted in my presentation. And finally, it's time for Q&A. And a very special thank you to Dr. Giorgio Savini. Thank you very much. Thank